Great, it is recording now. So we're going to look at dialogue pathways and it's a formal introduction um, for how we're going to work, particularly on Tuesdays, um, so that we're still sharing things, but we're sharing things in a dialogic way. And, and as we share them, we're storing them as text. So that's the purpose of these dialogue pathways. And from that, we're going to build material that you can use, that you will use almost directly, just simple copy, copy and paste as data to go into your portfolio. So it's, it's not wasted. I know that no learning is wasted, but this is not wasted from your point of view. Is that it's going to go into your assessment and be marked and give you marks. And it's good because you're building it up from day one or day two from the first Tuesday and you're putting things into your portfolio or creating materials and data to go into your portfolio right from uh, this afternoon. And you can put them in and then we can look at them and we'll have portfolio sessions of uh, working through them with you, Jane and I will, and point out where you can improve them. So you're almost like grabbing marks. You can grab a, say, 52% with something that you do today. Work with us in workshops and increase that up to a 62 or 65% as you improve it. And it's my new process for marking and for assessing this year to try and make sure that people are getting really good marks for this module. So it takes us right back to how we think and develop knowledge and grow knowledge and transfer knowledge in the tourism knowledge um, industry and the tour tourism knowledge academia. Um, and a lot of our work draws from, this is why I enjoy working in tourism because we can use any subject. We use a lot from geography and a lot from sociology, a lot from ethnography, um, and quite a bit from philosophy and social sciences as well. And a lot of what we do is we try and find out data from the world, which is my favourite and most, most exciting bit about tourism, because you can be doing some holiday making whilst you're finding something out. So you're working out in the field often. So one of the skills that we're trying to develop through uh, Jane and my module this term, this semester, is to make you feel that when you are out um, enjoying yourself on holiday, you can also do some field work. And when you're doing some field work for university, you could also enjoy yourself. So it's mixing those two. This model that I've developed over a few years about where knowledge comes from as we learn. Uh, it comes from books, so um, material that you go and find in the library, um, a lot more material that you find online, from the good textbooks, ones that you trust and that you value um, what the author has written in there, and also from journals. And these academic journals or scientific journals, as they're sometimes called, these are organised and managed and run by publishers with academics who are in a research active mode in their careers. And they do some research in the field, use methods and methodologies that we can believe and understand, and then write up their results and publish them in journals. But before they're made live, two other people from um, the, the first person the researcher doesn't know, looks at those and peer reviews them. A peer, a P-E-E-R, a peer, is someone who's in the same um, academic level as you. So when you're working with um, uh, first year students, stage four students, you're in a peer group there of about uh, 15 or 20 people, they're your peer group. So you're roughly at the same level intellectually and academically. And what researchers do is that their work is sent by an editor to two people from their peer group and they check their publication and only then does it go live and, and the world uses it and reads it then. When we read those journal articles and books, the way that we tell our, our reader, this is, this is you or me doing some research or being a, a learner, when we write essays or stories, we use references to prove that we've gone back to books and journal articles that we can trust. So that's the method of getting the knowledge that we can trust that knowledge, get it through into the researcher or the undergraduate student, and then they put that out into their essay or their story. And that's their material that they've given to the world as an essay or a story. 
And usually the person, the people that see that is a marker, um, a moderator, and then in June, the external examiner looks at quite a lot of the work as well. So in a way, they are peer reviewed as well before someone judges them and gives them a, a final mark and says whether they're worth a degree or not. The middle place that we get to new knowledge from is from the mind. So as you're working and thinking, you're generating new ideas and new thoughts all the time. Just as the, these first nine minutes into this lecture, we've all changed a lot. We've, we've gone through having a really nice chat and catching up with people and telling each other that we got soaked. So we've got some new knowledge there. And then we've settled into a more formal 30 or 40 minutes. And we're hoping that the way that knowledge is being delivered through a formal lecture from someone who's experienced and trained and qualified is that we've, we're finding a, a more um, concentrated form of, uh, of knowledge being poured in. And some of that will stick. Um, we know from lots of uh, research that if you then practice and use that uh, knowledge that's just been poured at you from a, from a lecture, from a professor, and just talked to, if we can, if we can practice it, and share it in some way, then that makes it stick a little bit better, makes it work better. And one of the ways that you can do that if there's no one around is to do journaling. And journaling is either taking some notes, but I know because I've spent years taking notes in lectures, and I know that you can never keep up with the lecturer. If, if the lecturer says never keep up, then you look down at your notes and it says keep up. There's hardly any of it goes down. I did, I did go through a period of trying to learn one of, or two of the different shorthand methods, but and I wasn't patient enough to learn it. But by my lecture notes have, have improved over the years, but there's still not a proper transcription of what went on in the lecture. So we, that's one way of journaling is, is your notes. Another way of journaling, and there's something that you might do later, is that you might think that was a really useful lecture, I'll just jot some things down now as, as you've perhaps got 15 minutes at the end of the lecture and you've still got the room or you pop downstairs and get a cup of coffee or sit in a different space and just and you know I, I'm really keen on you doing that and I'm using different types of notebook to write things down especially with Google uh, Google Lens that you can now turn your handwritten notes into typed up notes automatically. So journaling is a really good skill to develop. And it's um, it's a mixture. It's, it's journaling starts with note taking during a lecture, or if you're sitting in a cafe watching some tourism activity take place. Um, and then it turns into note making, where you want to go back and improve them a little bit. But it's also something where you might keep a, a, a good notebook near where you watch the telly or near where you go to bed. And when you have those brilliant thoughts, just as you doze dozing off, is to grab the notebook and, and write some notes down there. And that's journaling too. Sometimes it's great to capture those. I have heard, and Natalie used to do this, she used to keep her iPhone with her. And when she had those brilliant moments of thought, she would journal simply by recording them. And I think I've never used any of it, but I think there's some, um, software now to convert your spoken voice into uh, text so that you've got your notes fixed because there's nothing more difficult than trying to find something in voice recordings it takes ages to go through them the third way then is to be in the world and and take field notes um, as well as taking the field notes, you're having the experience of being in the world, which is a phenomenological experience. And so that's changing. Being in the world is changing this bit at the same time, the mind. But more formal ways of making sure that you've grabbed some notes whilst you're in the field. And I think for, for our work, it's uh, going on walks around seaside towns. It's going on walks around tourism spaces in cities like Plymouth and finding a space where you can, where you're in the dry and that you can actually write down some field notes, which is slightly more sophisticated than 
journaling. Journaling is um, unrestricted, quite free and easy. Whereas field notes, you have to remember a lot of points that, you, that you're trying to keep. And I'll speak to you more about field notes later on in another session. This is also when you're uh, in touch with the world, this includes the other people in the world, as well as the planet itself and the, and the land and the geography. Um, and so the other way that you're capturing written material from the world is through dialogue evidence. So you're, you're trying to make someone say something to you, say something to me, sort of, um, to stimulate some dialogue in lots of different ways. And when they do, you're trying to capture that, either tape record it, note take it, or really good nowadays because everyone's online, is to engage them in dialogue using one of the web two, one of the social media technologies, so that they're being forced to type that dialogue and it gives you some data straight away that you don't have to do any uh, conversion on. You don't have to convert it into word processed text. It's already there for you. So very nicely and neatly, and I did this a bit on purpose, is those three places where we get new knowledge from a BMW, BMW books, mind world, which is sort of a dream car, isn't it? particularly if they make them electric one day, the BMW. So it's a nice mnemonic for remembering that. So if you get to the end of the week and say, think, where have I got my knowledge from? And you can do a quick check from books, from mind, from world. Why bother? And why are we doing all this? Um, we're doing it so we learn. We're doing it so we get better and we, we get cleverer. But we're also doing it so we pass our degrees. Um, and so what I want to do and what I've done in this module is to make it that it's, it's worth collecting from day two because you could start to use that in the document that you're going to give in. And this is your portfolio that contains both an essay and a narrative. I hope that text is big enough uh, to read on screen. It's a little bit grey, it looks nice and neat on the screen, but it's a bit grey for viewing. But you'll get a chance to look through these as well, the real slides. You can, you can zoom in as much as you want. There's four things um, that the portfolio is going to contain. It's going to have an illustrated report on it inside it that's you that looks like a word process document and it's going to look at a tourism product and a tourism space quite a bit of it of those um, it's going to be a thousand words and quite a bit of those thousand words is where you're trying to tell us what product it is and what where that where it's located and let's think of a classic one say the the Plymouth gin it, um, works, which is a definite tourist attraction. It's definitely a tourism product because people go to it to look at the machinery, um, the, the brewing, it's not brewing, it's distilling, to look at the distilling equipment. Um, and they also, when they're looking at the tourism product and enjoying it and spending money on it, they're also in a tourism space. I feel from my knowledge of walking around that area down by the Barbican and down by Sutton Harbour in Plymouth, but that's definitely a tourism space. It's got lots of leisure um, facilities down there, but it's also got the uh, geology with the, with the limestone, the geomorphology with the nice slopes and the rocks going into the sea, um, and it's got the climate. Plymouth's got even though we can't believe it today, Plymouth's got one of the best climates in Britain. It, we do get a little bit of rain, well, a lot, but we also get um, really nice summers. So it is a tourism space from, the, from our point, point of view. So in that, in that report, the illustrated report, you might, for example, put a map to show which uh, tourism space you're exploring and that you're writing about. You might put uh, a photograph in the same way that I've got a photograph there of the British Ferries uh, ferry uh, anchored up in the harbour, uh, just to illustrate and show it. 
And if you're looking at particular, which really look at a particular tourism product in there, which might be an attraction, say like the, the is it called like no, the National Marine Marine Aquarium, isn't it? It's called. Um, you'd show a photograph of that and show how it's. You might then show a more detailed plan of how people can walk across to that at different times of the day. So there's quite a lot of that thousand words is going to be used up by positioning it, by citing it, by showing where it is. But then at some stage in the thousand words, probably around about halfway, perhaps a little bit before halfway, I need you then to switch to writing in essay format and using this type of writing that we call critical analysis. And the critical points that we're trying to make are about the sustainability of that product in that space. So let's think of a really crazy example, no, a really simple one, the one that everyone uses to start off with. Um, and the classic one, which you, you probably know if you've stayed in any hotel, is they tell you to reuse your towels. So you might be there for four nights and they ask you, if you possibly can, try and use your bath towel for all four nights. If it does get too soaking wet, then leave it in the tub or some places say hang it over the back of the door or throw it on the floor. Otherwise, they won't take it and launder it. And that will save some chlorine. It will save some carbon um, from boiling that towel and washing it. So a critical approach to that might be that you have a look in the, the bedrooms or you talk to a uh, jury's in, say the one across the road from uh, Cookworthy or two roads from Cookworthy and say, what's their policy on washing towels? And then be critical about that and say, they could do more or they, they're doing a fine job based on what their response is. So that's about being critical. Critical starts by challenging what people and companies are claiming they're doing uh, and, and what governments are claiming they're doing and then don't deliver on. So being critical starts, it's, it's got that slight edge to it, the word critical as, as being a little bit ne negative. It doesn't mean being negative, but it gives you a way in to say, can I pick at that? Can I find something that people haven't thought about in that? And there's a great array of words that show you being critical and one of them is however a brilliant one is but um, and although although they claim to be um, uh, have great, strong green credentials they don't um, don't they wash towels too frequently they don't offer um, the, the chance to save the towel during the whole stay it might be that you've been a little bit more sophisticated and think what about that tourism product in that tourism space and it might be that um, they're offering a, offering the type of food that isn't easy to get there isn't easy to obtain there so you might be in um, the tourism space might be edinburgh and it's difficult to um, have strawberries or peaches in Edinburgh because it's going to cost a lot of money to transport peaches there. So being critical, you would look at the menus in that uh, restaurant and say they always offer a, a peach, a peaches for pudding, and it's a lot of air miles to transport a peach all the way up to Edinburgh. So that's being more sophisticated with your critical analysis and you're analysing more about the what the product is doing within that space. You see how it changes, how the local terroir, the local food uh, changes, depending on where you are. So that's what the report with its essay section is going to look like. That's a thousand words, plus or minus 5%. And as I went through in detail yesterday, that doesn't include any pasted in evidence texts. So if you've talked to someone, you've interviewed someone or you've entered into dialogue with someone, then you might have some evidence texts in there and you might store them in a little pale pink box in the same way that it is on here. Or if it was dialogue that you engaged in um, in the uh, 
Microsoft Teams, then you'd paste it in higher up in the portfolio. The second piece I want from you, I know this is a bit long-winded, but we've, it's good to have gone through it all. Um, and then it settles with you while, while you, because it's the first time you've gone through it in this much detail. The second long piece of writing that goes into your portfolio is a narrative text, which communicates a field work experience that you've put yourself through and it communicates it to a wider public. So you're writing for a readership that isn't just your lecturers. So you're not writing in a scientific essay style and you're writing so that um, your folks back home could read it and enjoy it. You're writing it so the DMO would pick up and read it. And you're writing a, a general tourism readership. Someone who was planning to go to Newquay, for example, would find it and read it so that they, they don't need to have a scientific knowledge of tourism in order to enjoy reading it. You see, that's a little bit longer because you're going to write that in a, a three leaf, a three instalment style. And to, a, a narrative text includes I, so the I narrator is in there. So you, you appear in that text and you choose to do a piece of field work that you can get to quite easily, that you can get to safely during COVID um, and that you can hopefully try and get back to over the, over the coming weeks. It might mean if you're in lockdown or self-isolation at home, and then pick, a town, pick somewhere near your home that you can easily walk to and don't need public transport. If you've managed to get into university and you're here in, on campus and in Plymouth, then um, there's two great places that Jane and I know and use a lot. That's down on, around Sutton Harbour, drifting over to the Barbican and the Mayflower Steps. And then one that's a little bit more difficult to go and access, but is worth the challenge. And that's to go right across to Royal William Yard. I feel that Royal William Yard, well, I'm, I know it is because it's much newer. It's, it's younger than I've been here in Plymouth. So it's probably only about eight years it's been there. And it was built with leisure in mind. It was, it's the first space I've watched being built as a tourism space right from scratch. Whereas Sutton Harbour, when Sutton Harbour was born about 400 years ago, probably 300 years ago, maybe 400, over 400, because the pilgrims left from there. Yeah, for more than 400 years ago. It wasn't conceived as a leisure space, as a tourism space back then. It was conceived as a, a place for easy loading of uh, alcohol, for, for bringing brandy and wine from France. Which I suppose you could argue is the hospitality industry. So when you're writing that one, you're writing it um, talking in the past tense about you and your experience and using I did this and then I did that, that type of writing, which is a really big contrast, contrast from critical analytical writing, where you're writing rational essay style. And you'll see that the, the enjoyment of having to work in two different discourses is really helpful gives you a chance to express things in different ways. The third thing that will go in the portfolio is dialogue, and that's to show your evidence of engagement in MS Teams. And we're going to do that in about 10 minutes or so and do uh, some examples of trying to make that work in there. And then the final piece of work is going to be your final text that will be looked at and marked is your references list. And that's a list of everything that you've cited that's gone into the into all of the others. Never be afraid to cite anything um, and, and put that into your references list. It's not counted in your word count in any way, but it is marked in the assessment. It's marked in, I think, section three of your assessment to see whether you um, did enough reading, basically. And then the cover for the portfolio, I've used Canva dot com because you can go into it for free for quite a long time i've used it for free for about two years um, and it doesn't pester you too much to to join and pay money but you can get some nice designs out there just watch that you are using free ones unless you want to join and pay i keep being tempted to um, and then design a front cover for your portfolio like that
let's try and it, it's hard now to move from me just talking to get you to change tack and and, and actually write but I'll, I'll talk up over these next three slides and then we'll try and have a go at finding some way to make this breakthrough and start to actually write something one of the best ways to start to write something in our subject area in tourism is to write a review and share it of a tourism space or of a tourism product so and again a really nice way to do anything is to look at someone else's first especially one that someone claims that it's quite a good one so it's a, a, a template or an example or even better an exemplar one that's got aspects to it that are worth um, copying not copying word for word but copying the style not the style either copying the um the format the structure so i've written one about the host hotel roscoff in roscoff which is across on the ferry from plymouth um deliberately taking it out of plymouth so that i don't spoil it if you're going to write about plymouth because i know plymouth is quite new to a lot of you um and this is to try and understand uh, the format of reviews and a really nice format for writing a review of anyone so that you don't get into any uh, arguments with them is to write two stars and a wish so two great things about the place and i know sometimes it's hard to find two great things about some of the places um, so two great things about the place and then if you if you did find that there was a problem that the service was bad or that the room was dirty or that the weather was awful then frame that in a conditional way frame it as a wish and i wish it had been a little bit warmer or i wish the path hasn't been so muddy and it's a way of telling the if it is a tourism provider who's providing the product and that person has some control over the product it's a way of telling them how to improve if it's a tourism space sometimes there's not much we can do about it if we if we say it rains too much there's no one to tell off about that so i suppose someone could put a roof up and make it a little bit drier but um when we complain about the tourism space we again if we do that as a wish it doesn't direct the complaint to anyone not complaining but anyone reading it who could do something about the tourism space will understand that they could improve that so that's what's the best way to do it because i'm about to say, uh, you see this is the imperative here choose a tourism project you know well from near home preferably or a holiday you remember very well and write your own review Let's try how I can move to that. I'll, I'll come back to this slide and I'll, I'll propose it as a definite activity in a moment, but I'll run to the end. I'll show you the post that I've done and then I'll re I'll re propose this. I'll rebrief this section. So we'll come back to these two and as a rebriefing in a moment. Even so we remember them. We're going to come back up to this slide in a moment. Where, where do you do it? This is sort of long term over the next two to three weeks is your evidence bank and your evidence bank is in the portfolio and the portfolio uh, template is buried somewhere in uh, Microsoft OneNote for you to go and find in Microsoft Teams. And I want you to paste in three examples of evidence under this. There's a heading in there called evidence bank which looks like this little design here in the book um, and in it you're going to paste in three examples so this review that you're about to do in a moment then your best question that you've asked in the dialogue team posts sometimes called conversations in microsoft um, teams and along with the respondents post of reply just to show you're asking questions that do stimulate a reply so you say you don't say do you like cheese no so that's not a very rich reply and then finally a post of reply that you have given when someone has asked you a question about your review which is evidence that you're a great respondent and that you're able to give a lot back to um, to the knowledge of other people 
this is a I might have to talk about this again as we as you do more of these. So what initiates a productive dialogue? Answer a well-crafted question. And it's a question that draws on the respondent's work. So it's good if you start to find out where someone lives or has been um, so that you know that they've got some knowledge about that. It's no good asking me anything about Tangier. Although I've researched Tangier as a holiday destination, I've never been, so I've got no real feeling for it. But I have been to, um, say, New York. So ask me, you could ask me what I felt about New York. And I did grow up in the English Peaks, the Peak District, which has become a real tourist spot. So uh, that would be a really good question. You know, it shows that you know your respondent and their work, what they've done. It ought to be an open question that can't be answered yes or no. So, Charlie, do you like the Peak District? Yes. So that's not no good. Uh, yes, you want something more than that because there's no real new knowledge there. And that tiny little bit of knowledge, Charlie says yes when he's asked if he likes the Peak District. Not enough. We want richness in the answers. This is a nice little neat way though, if someone just says yes and you find that you've accidentally asked a closed question, a yes or no answer, there's a great little uh, catalyst that opens it up. So Charlie says no or yes, and then you throw another question at them, why? And off they go. So you can reopen a closed question once the person's responded. And the third aspect of a good, productive, a well-crafted question is a question that draws on theory from the area to elicit a rich response. And this is where you've started to read your books in your BMW scenario, and you start to know some theory. And you know, for example, that um, uh, educated um, holidaymakers like authenticity because you've read the theories of uh, Bourdieu and cultural capital. So you, you frame a question that brings in and draws that theory in. And you say, you say to someone, I know you like museums, but um, wh where do you think that started from? Did you, did you go to university and study it? So you've been really clever at bringing in your knowledge of the theory and making the respondent consider that as well as they answer your question. I think we will have to do these last two slides again before we do questioning. But let's go back to that. Let's just do a stop share a moment to just see how people are doing if there's any questions. Great, no one's either. Yeah, everyone, everyone's still there. That's that's reassuring. What I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to try and brief you with that um, that slide from three slides ago and try and get you to do that. But I think perhaps best is to try and show you my review first, if I can find it. And I've stored it somewhere on Microsoft. I'll put it in dialogue somehow, somewhere. I think I put it in the notebook part. They call it the PLC notebook. Yes, I found it, I found it. So I'm going to share screen again and show you my review because I've got it in the right. Can everyone see a kind of um, a bluey purple screen with Microsoft Teams? Could someone? Yeah. Oh, Tom, sorry, no wonder. Could someone shout yes? Unmute and shout yes if you can yeah. see the mic. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Right. I'll press on with that then. So this is a review that I feel quite proud of. I'm a, I'm a Google, what do they call them? A Google reviewer. Oh, they've got a nicer name from that. A local, local guide, a Google local guide. In, when you've got a Google account and you've had it for a few days, you can apply to be a Google local guide. And then you um, uh, can paste reviews of places um, and post photographs of places and food and then write, write up reviews and give stars um, to say whether you like the place or not. And you, it, it's really good, it, it encourages you to do it because you start to win points. And from the points, you slowly win uh, different colored orange badges with a different number of points on the star. 
you become a star yourself. And you get more and more points around your star, so you look like um, you look like you're a star in the in the heavens when you've been doing it for a couple of years. So it's, it's quite a nice um, way to encourage you to do that. They also did um, when you get to reach certain star levels, they invite you to a training course in New York, which I was really excited about. And I, I, I did get that. I won that. And uh, the day came for me to go on the training course in New York. And you've guessed it. It was done in a Google Hangout. So I was still sat in my little room, my little study. And they, and, but the Google people were all in New York enjoying it. But hey ho, it's a, it was a nice idea, a nice idea. So this is one I wrote for them. And what I've done, I've brought it out and I've repasted it into Microsoft Teams. Um, and I'm in what's called the PLC Notebook. And this is, there are two packages here that Microsoft have sold to the university that we've bought so we can work this properly. One's Microsoft Teams, but the other one's Microsoft OneNote. And the way that they, they fit into each other allows you to collaborate, they kind of, they integrate. So even though I'm, I look like the framework around here, the Chrome around the screen is Microsoft Teams. When I'm in the PLC notebook, I'm within uh, OneNote. And OneNote behaves slightly differently. Oops. OneNote behaves slightly differently. And it's a little bit tricky to use. You see, when I click on it, it forms a really pale frame around there. And that's that's a, a posted entry in the notebook that, that does sort of belong to the original author. But if you were to go in there, you could go in there and edit it and change it and ruin it. And that's the, the excitement of working in collaborative Web2 uh, software like this. Is that, is that there's always the risk that someone can change it. So, and I've written it so it's instructions as well. It's uh, when you review a tourism product, or when you review a tourism products, for example, attractions, hotels, cafes, transport, use the two stars and a wish format to help you start from the ground floor. I've been a little bit witty there. I've taken a photograph of uh, uh, a, a sign from a lift saying access to the ground floor. From one of the, from the hotel, in fact, the hotel in Roscoff. Uh, here's a hotel review on Google Maps from their local guide social media engagement initiative. And there we were. That's when we could still travel back in the good old days, back in 2013. This guy he works for in, in Belfast now for the um, the Titanic experience. He got a really good job from his degree at Plymouth. And this chap here, um, he does a video blogging, a video of vlogs on YouTube, makes a living out of it and travels all over the Far East. So let's try and go to it, so I'll click on it to follow the link. Now, this is a big question. Is the, will this screen come up for you? I better stop share and share again. Stop share. Again. Can you now see uh, a Google Maps uh, screen in my browser, please? Okay, so I'll yeah. talk about this. Um, great, hey, thank you, thanks guys, good. So it's Google Maps and it's, um, it's focused in on this hotel, the Regina in Roscoff. And if I, if I zoom out a little bit with that, you'll see where Roscoff is. It's across the sea from, um, from Plymouth. You go on the ferry across to Northern France to Finisterre. And if you, it first of all offers you um, that you can book there, someone's advertising and you can actually uh, book, gives you the address where it is. 
And somewhere down here is the reviews. Now there they are, their reviews, and it and it does some uh, quantitative analysis, rounds up the reviews, and gives people gives an overall score of the reviews. And then this is my review here as a local guide. So I gave it five stars a long time ago now, eight years ago, and in here you'll try. I want you to try and detect two positive points I'm making, which I call two stars and then a wish of what I'd like. So we first stayed at the Hotel of Asian App with our tourism fieldwork group from Plymouth University in October, 2012. They looked after us really well. So here he is, he's beginning to give one of his stars. We arrived in the early morning off the Brittany Ferry sailing from Plymouth and checking was really efficient and they arrived, gave us extra heating in the rooms. So there's, there's my first strong uh, star, my first good point that I'm telling them. That they looked after us, the check-in was fast and efficient. And then this extra special thing that they did, because it was cold in October, even in Rothschild. And so they popped some um, uh, oil-fired heaters in the rooms for the people who were feeling a bit fragile. Because it's in October, it's quite a crossing. It can uh, leave you a little bit seasick. Then a bit of information. I don't know whether that's positive or not, but I suppose it is that we're booked again for 2013. And then an additional good point is that the hotel is right next to the railway station for our expedition to Morley, which is, it's, it really is, say, 20 or 30 metres. It's really close. So you can just sort of tumble out of the hotel for breakfast and go and get onto the train that takes you down to the, the first big town of Morlay. And it's got museums and uh, nice restaurants down in Morlay. So that's my second good point. But now I want to complain about something. But I don't want to make it sound like a complaint. So here I go with my wish. I wish, and this is a, this is the name of the DMO, Conseil Général Finistère. So if I was in Plymouth, I would say, I wish Plymouth City Council and Brittany Ferries would work together and arrange a coach to meet foot passengers from the, from the ferry terminal, which is called Bloscon, and take them to the railway station. Joined up tourism transport would be a wonderful thing. In fact, that, that moan uh, couched as a wish is equally applicable here in Plymouth because Plymouth City Council have never done anything about putting a coach on. And you get off the ferry in Plymouth at about 9.15 in the evening and it's raining and miserable and there's no taxis. And I don't know if you've found the ferry terminal yet down at Mill Bay, but it's a long way from anywhere. And you, you just feel if they just popped a, a couple of minibuses on or anything, because they know when the they know when the ferry is coming in, it wouldn't be much to do. So it's a moan, but it's a moan couched as a wish. Print, stop share. Just stop the recording there.